The Mike Broomhead Show is sponsored in part by Cliff Castle Casino Hotel, the perfect place to play. DPS is calling it domestic terrorism. Multiple vehicles struck by projectiles, many of them confirmed to be bullets. Not even safe to drive to work. Welcome to the Mike Broomhead Show. Well, I got a message. I got a song. Can I get a witness? Tell me what's going on. Show the people. Hey, thanks for being here. It's the Mike Broomhead Show. It's a brand new show on AZTV7. We are going to be very Arizona specific. It is the greatest state in the entire country. We're going to talk about what's important to all of us. So each week we're going to do a few different things. We're going to have something called Broomhead's Best. Broomhead's Best is going to be something that's Arizona centric and something that's great that's going on or that happened right here in Arizona. We've got a great interview today with Governor Doug Ducey. He joins us to talk all things Arizona, what's happening right now, decisions he's made, and what's coming up in the future. But we're going to start every week off with something we call the sweep. Let's get into it. All right, the sweep is all the big headlines, and the biggest one right now is the I-10 shootings. It's being called domestic terrorism by the DPS. There are multiple vehicles along the I-10 during the early morning commute while it's still dark. Vehicles are being hit by what's being called projectiles. They're not all being called bullets because they're not all confirmed to be, but most of them are. Now, they have got DPS has got their gang unit. They have also got their undercover units. You know Phoenix PD is involved in all of this. So it's overt and covert operations, but they still don't know who this is. There's a hotline. It's being broadcast on the freeways. If you see something, give them a call. Frank Milstead, the director of the DPS, has been saying that this is something that's got to stop very quickly, and I know we can all help. Secondly, Kim Davis has become a household name. She is the woman in Kentucky, the county clerk that was sent to jail because she refused to issue same-sex marriage licenses. She said it doesn't matter what the court says, she is obeying God's law. I applaud anyone who is willing to stand up for their principles, but is she going to sacrifice her job to do it? That's the issue. It's got to cost you something. If you're required by the courts to do a job and you can't or won't do it, stepping down is the sacrifice that lends credibility to what you're doing. Kim Davis has got to step down, in my opinion. If she does, she's a hero. She can't draw a paycheck and then not do the job she's getting paid to do. Next, the government shutdown. The government may shut down for two reasons. Well, Really, it's one, and it's Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is the big discussion that's going to happen on Capitol Hill. Will we fund Planned Parenthood? The president has promised to veto it if it gets to his desk that defunds Planned Parenthood. But there are 26 Republicans in the House of Representatives that say, doesn't matter what's in the budget, if it includes funding Planned Parenthood, they're not going to have anything to do with it. Now, the president promises to veto that and also going to veto a no vote on the Iran deal. Well... They aren't going to do anything about the Iran deal because of the veto. Let's see if they stand strong and where we end up when it comes to those two big issues. Two big pressing issues as Congress has gone back into session. And now lastly, 9-11. Another anniversary of 9-11 has come and gone. Where were you? Most of us can answer that question immediately. Where were you when you found out that we were under attack? Where were you when those planes hit the buildings in New York City and the Pentagon? When the plane went down in Pennsylvania? What's odd is there is a generation of high school students, people now that are old enough to understand a terrorist attack that have no recollection of 9-11. They're only gonna know about that day, what we teach them in schools or what we tell them. Are the news agencies going to report accurately? Are we going to see the planes hit the buildings? Is it something we should do? Are we better? Are we smarter? Are we safer? These are all valid questions. Were the wars worthwhile in the fallout after 9-11? All of those are very, very valid questions. Coming up today on the show, Governor Doug Ducey joins me in a few moments. The governor's going to talk about the decisions he's made at the beginning of his term as governor and what he sees for Arizona's future. All of that is coming up here in just a few moments, but I want you to get social with us. You can follow us on Twitter, look for us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook. I'd love to interact with you in just a moment. Governor Doug Ducey joins me. Thanks for being here. The Mike Broomhead Show.
First time I've been up here, we are in the governor's office of the state capitol. Governor Ducey, thanks for being on the show. Welcome, Mike. It's great to have you here. Congratulations. It's odd. Well, it's funny because I was just thinking on the way up here, um, I've known you for quite a while, and now to come up here and call you Governor Ducey is, is quite an honor for me. But it's, it's pretty amazing to watch what you've done. Talk to me about public service. Why, why take a job you didn't need? Well, I love the state of Arizona. You know, I came out here from Toledo, Ohio. I didn't know one person. I'd never been here. My folks split up my junior year of high school and uh, drove to Arizona State University and attended school there and uh, built my business here. I feel like so much good has come here. I met my wife here. I've raised my three boys here. And I just thought the state could do better. Uh, I thought we should aim higher as a state. And this was the first open seat for governor in 12 years. And I thought as an entrepreneur, I want to make a difference there. And there's really no substitute for elective office or public service. So I took the plunge and, and here I am. So you were the treasurer for, how did that job as the state treasurer prepare you for what's happening now? Well, especially in a time of scarcity, I mean, we're all down on what's happening in the economy nationally. And we'd like to see it come back to what we've enjoyed for the last 20 years. Uh, I couldn't believe the state didn't have a balanced budget. I couldn't believe the state was borrowing money when I'd seen nothing but growth in this state for two plus decades. So as treasurer it prepared me because you're really at the intersection of Maine and Maine where all the state dollars flow and all the federal dollars flow. We've been able to turn the state around financially we haven't turned the state around economically yet, but you have to have a strong financial footing to build the economy that we expect here. All right, so let's talk about some of those decisions because some of them have been a little controversial with people. The decisions to cut budgets in places, what's gonna happen with education, throwing money at the problem, is that the solution? But everyone's concerned about their kids and if money solved the problem, everybody say throw money at it. But what have you learned in that regard? What do we do to balance the budget? But then what do you need to do to spend it wisely to make sure we're squeezing every penny out of it? Well, I think the first fundamental is that you, you have to have a balanced budget. I mean, everyone watching your show, uh, the, the station, your radio station, everyone has to live within their means except for government. Government hasn't been able to do that. So when I came into office, I said, we're going to balance this budget. Uh, that was an expectation. Uh, we did protect K-12 education, and I think sometimes that's lost. We're actually spending more money in K-12 education today than we ever have in the history of the state. But we're a growing state. We want to continue to be a growing state. We need those resources, but it's not just funding that gets you there. It's also reforms and accountabilities. And what I want to focus on in my administration is results, and results for all of our kids and being supportive of our teachers. When you look at some of the things that have happened in the time you've been in office, um, and I forget the exact number of business leaders you spoke with during the Super Bowl week mm -hmm. and you met with business leaders from around the country well now Apple is coming to the East Valley and they are going to set up a headquarters here what's next and, and what does that say to the rest of the business world if Apple wants to set up in Arizona We've had some huge wins in a short amount of time. I mean, you talked about Apple, we could talk about Uber, we could talk about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos and the innovative ideas that are coming to Arizona all the way to, to microbreweries. But it says that we're open for business. I think all of us, whether we're from Florida or Ohio or we're native Arizonans, we know what a great quality of life we have here. And what I want is the rest of the country to know Arizona is the best place to live, work, play, recreate, retire, visit, build the business and get an education. That's our opportunity here. We have a product, I mean, when I ask a room, how many of you were born somewhere other than the state of Arizona? It seems like 80% of the hands go up. So that is the first sign of how attractive we are and the economic opportunity that we have. What I want to do as governor is work with the business community, work with the academic community, work with influencers and decision makers to maximize that. So what was it like, I'm going to go backwards, because what was it like walking into this office the first time when you realized, I'm governor? I mean, what was that like for you? It's, a, it, it's um, in many ways, it's the culmination of all the effort that you put in, but it's a huge responsibility. And for me, it energized me. It made me think of all the, the reasons that I ran, of jump-starting our economy, on uh, improving our reputation, on fixing K-12 education. And then the other things, I mean, if you're a chief executive officer, if you're a business owner and you like solving problems and you like making decisions every day, this is a great job. So I feel very lucky and blessed to have it. I hear a, a, a clock ticking 
because time is short. In many ways, we're already through one session. You only get four legislative sessions. So in many ways, we're eight months in, but we're 25% of the way done. So we want to lay the groundwork for what we can do next because it's not about having the title governor. It's not about being somebody. It's about doing something. And we want to do big things in this office. Um, I've maintained that if we are going to recover, we're going to need people that have been successful in the business world to come back and fix the fiscal problems of, of government. Well, you've done that, and I know some people you know have. What do you say to those other business leaders out there that are here? How do they get involved? What should they be doing? Well, they should be supportive of, of what we're doing, especially around K-12 education. When you've got K-12 going in the right direction, you've got kids that are 18 years old and coming out of high school, they're either going on to college or they're going into the workforce and building fulfilling careers. And the best thing a business person can do to help the state is to have incredible success. When they have incredible success, they have a growing enterprise, they're hiring people, they're taking people off the rolls of the state, they're producing jobs in the economy. You know, it's not governors or elected leaders or politicians that create jobs, even though a lot of them talk like they do. It's entrepreneurs that are taking a risk and putting their capital at risk and having some success and then needing help and hiring people. I want to ask you about a couple of things, um, the K through 12 we've talked about, but also some changes you made at DCS. Now, you're the third governor that's done something with DCS that wants to make changes. I want to talk about that in a minute. We'll be back here with Governor Ducey in a moment to talk about DCS and some of the other things he plans on doing while he's in office. We'll be back. We're back in the governor's office with Governor Ducey. Um, DCS, uh, changes made over the years. Uh, the solution seems so important to everyone. When you think about children in the foster care system, the thousands of calls in the past that have happened. You made some changes in that office. What do you see happening? What needs to happen in that office? Well, we, we had to make changes. We have over 17,000 children in the care of the state. And the government just isn't that good at taking care of, of kids. So to me, Mike, leadership is very important. Not only what I expect out of, of my office and my senior staff, but also out of my agency head. So we made a change there. We put in a, a new leader in terms of what we want to see from DCS and in the personnel. And we want people to focus on safety and on permanency. A, a, a permanent uh, relationship for these kids is, is so important and also a better system in, in which to handle it. So part of the reason I talk about our education system and our economy is really those things go so far in solving so many problems of public policy but we're always going to have kids that have parents that don't take care of them. And that's our obligation as, as a state, is to take care of the, the most vulnerable. And DCS is doing better at that, but we've got a long way to go. And people out there that are doing the Lord's work in terms of being foster parents or court-appointed special advocates or working with these children, they make a huge difference in these kids' lives. And that's what I want to do, and my wife, Angela, as well. So when you look at two years down the road, three years down the road, and you don't want to be presumptu you know, presumptuous and say a second term, but what do you see happening? What do you want to go through this first term and have accomplished, whether it's economically or just in general, what do you want to see happen differently from when you walked in the door to the end of that first term? So I think in terms of results, much like at Cold Stone Creamery, which was the business that I built before I did this, I would be able to talk to you about how many stores we had operating, how much ice cream we were selling, how many states we were in, how many countries we were in. I want to think in terms of those same results, in terms of growing our economy, not just to have a larger GDP, but so that our citizens are, are making more. They have a higher quality of life. They're able to access the things they want, in terms, whether that's a home or a college education for their kids or to move to the neighborhood that they choose. So you can measure all of those things and you can demonstrate those results. And the same is true in education. You can look at, uh, do we have more third graders that can read at the end of that year? How are we doing in the national math scores at the end of eighth grade? How's our high school graduation rate? Are we lowering our high school dropout rate? And then measure our per capita income. I think if you start with the people and then work from there in terms of providing that better quality of life, one, you find issues that don't divide us but bring us together, like economic development and education do, but you also focus on things to get results. How has your business world and experience helped you? How is it the same and how is it different in what you're doing now? Well, government is not a business, uh, but there are 
business-like principles that can be applied to government, like accountability, like living within your means and balancing a budget, like picking the right people. I mean, when you put the right person in as an agency head, just like every parent out there knows that when you put the right teacher inside the classroom, I mean, the biggest difference uh, my sixth grader, Sam Ducey, is gonna have this year is who's his teacher inside that classroom. And we're, when we're getting that right, and education is not a business either. I mean, a academia is different. But that idea of people selection. So those things are, are the things that are the same. The things that are different are you get to make decisions here, and you aren't always held accountable for them because they'll outlive your term of four years. So really digging into the hard work of, of government, of looking at each of these agencies and saying, how do we make it more effective and efficient? How do we put somebody in place in leadership there and say, hey, it's easier to beg for permission uh, or easier to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission and take an entrepreneurial attitude to that agency so that it's consumer friendly to the taxpayer. You know, we all have a smartphone now. We're able to access all kinds of things to it. Why can't we get our driver's license over it? The, our smartphone or, or renew our, our, uh, our, our license plates, these types of things to, to make it easier on our citizens and to drive costs out of our government so we can allow the, the private sector and job creation to happen. All right, give me, one, I want one perk before we close out the interview, one perk of this job that you thought this is really cool. I mean, something you gotta, I walk up here, it's the first time I've been up here and it's a beautiful office. There's gotta be one perk of the job you gotta say, this is pretty cool to be the governor. Well, I think you, you get to work with a lot of smart people and you lot of have a lot of help from your staff. So, um, w you know, with security and the Department of Public Safety, I'm able to jump in the uh, passenger seat and they drive uh, me around. And so I can work the, the phones, make, make calls. I can read and prepare for what I need to do. That's, uh, that, that's something that I think I'd have a tough time getting used to. Your yeah. security team, is no joke. They're I terrific. Mean, they are great guys. They're I, terrific. I saw those guys in the parking lot. Guys thought, and you know, gals. If yeah. I had a problem, I don't think I'd get in your face. I don't think I'd approach you too quickly. Yeah, you got a good security team. Well, and they're great, you know, and, and the citizens have been great as well. I'm trying to figure out who voted against me because everybody comes <laughs> up and tells me that they, they voted for me. And it's been more when I have to go, just like I'm gonna leave here and, and, and go speak in an event, I'll get in the car and, and they'll get me there and I'll be able to read the remarks and, and get familiar with them or, or make the calls I need to make. So that, that, that's a real perk and that's very helpful to be unproductive. Well, I appreciate the time. It, it is, I'm proud to see you in the office, and it's great to be in and, and talk with you. And thanks for having uh, some time on the show. Thanks for coming up here, Mike. Thanks, really Joe. appreciate, appreciate it. it, Mike. Thank you. We'll be back. so much that happens around the valley that's good and we just don't talk enough about it. So each week we're going to pause. We're going to look at something great happening in the state of Arizona. I can't think of a better way to kick this off than to do it with the Marine Corps. It's called Broomhead's Best. All right, it is Marine Week, and the United States Marines have chosen Phoenix, Arizona for Marine Week. They have got ex exhibitions going on all over the valley. They've got a helicopter you can go through. And, of course, the silent drill team. If you have never seen the United States Marine Corps silent drill team, they have been featured in films, television commercials. They put on a demonstration every night during the summers at the Marine Barracks in Washington, D.C. But it shows you the discipline, the timing. It is everything great about the United States Marine Corps. They wear their dress blues, which is the most recognizable uniform in the United States military. And they're right here in the valley. And we can't forget the Marine Corps band as well. It, they say it's not a recruiting stop because they're meeting their recruiting goals. But the fact is the United States Marines are the most recognized outfit in the United States military. And when you see the discipline and you see the greatness of this silent drill team, it really takes it out of you. You watch them on YouTube, but when you get to see it in person and they're here for Marine Week. So to all of the current Marines that are here for Marine Week and for all the former Marines that are here in the Valley, Semper Fi, we are glad you here, you're here, and it is something that is absolutely outstanding to have them right here celebrating Marine Week. So thank you to the United States Marines, the history that is there. 
One of the great things about being here in Arizona is our military presence. We have got great military presence with the National Guard, Luke Air Force Base right here, you know, down south in Tucson at Davis Monthan. We know that we've got a great military presence and we are very honored to have a lot of veterans that are right here in the Valley as well. So when the Marines chose us for Marine Week, it was an easy choice for us. Broomhead's best had to be the United States Marines, Marine Week, and that silent drill team. If you didn't catch them, you can catch them in DC in the summers or you can watch them online. It is really something spectacular to see. We're gonna close things out here in just a few moments. We're gonna talk to you about what's coming up on next week's show. So stick around and thanks for being here on AZTV7 and the Mike Broomhead Show. The Mike Broomhead Show is sponsored in part by Cliff Castle Casino Hotel, the perfect place to play. Every week before we close out the show, we're going to talk about the things that are burning up the internet. Those viral videos, the ones that everybody's talking about, we're going to do it. We call it hashtag this. All right, unfortunately, the video that everyone's talking about this week involves two high school football players that blindsided a referee during a football game. There's a couple of conflicting stories. The video is really horrendous to see. Absolutely blindsides somebody that's defenseless, and there are actually going to be criminal charges. The kids have been suspended. One of the coaches is on paid leave, and they should be. Now, I coached high school football for a long time before I moved to Arizona, and I can tell you it is a great tool. The sport of football is a great way to teach people life lessons, how to win with grace, how to lose with dignity, team sports, to work together for a common goal, personal differences set aside. This is an attack. And if these kids aren't punished, and if that coach isn't punished, that is an absolute shame. Check out the video. Millions of hits in 48 hours. Everyone's been talking about it all week long. I want to thank Governor Doug Ducey for joining me this week. It was a great interview and an honor to have him on the first show that we've done. And speaking of football, coming up next week, Cardinals owner Michael Bidwill joins us. Can you believe the Cardinals have been in University of Phoenix Stadium for 10 years? We're going to talk about those 10 years, talk about the future, the hopes for this season, and what that building has meant not only to the Cardinals, but to everybody here in the state of Arizona. All of that's coming up on next week's show. I want to thank the governor. Thanks for being here. Have a great week, everybody. God bless.